the introduction. So I'll say I'm good with the recording. Okay, cool. And um, thanks for the introduction and for inviting me. So I um, absolutely love plotting data. Uh, I probably like ended up doing the wrong thing in my life uh, with uh, taking a PhD in psychology because it has, has ended up with me just sitting coding and a lot of the time I'm literally just making plots. Uh, I love making pretty plots. Uh, I love making um, ggplot extension packages. Um, so this is a thing I know quite a lot about, but that doesn't mean I didn't learn a lot when I started preparing for this talk because I thought I wanted to like showcase extra lots of stuff you could do. So the end plot is maybe actually a little bit more chaotic than I would usually go for, but it does like showcase uh, uh, how you can customize your ggplots. So I'm gonna start some screen sharing. I'm just gonna rearrange my, there's a lot of, so I'm on a dual screen setup. So when you see me kind of like with my eyes over here, it's because this is where I have like my cheat sheet. <laughs> and this is also where you guys are. Um, and sharing my screen, it's this one. And hopefully you can all see a slide. And hopefully when I change the slide, you also see that changing. Cause I had a talk for our ladies in Helsinki and I was changing my slides and they couldn't see it. So that was, that was a bit frustrating. Um, Works great. Yeah, good. Um, so yeah, find me on Twitter, find me on GitHub. I also have a website where I periodically blog about art and, and neuroscience stuff. Um, and the title for today was Zhuzh up your ggplots. Now, Mina knows that it actually took me about 20 minutes to figure out how to spell zhuzh, because uh, I'd only actually ever heard it uh, spoken and I had been binging, um, I had been binging, binging RuPaul's Drag Race, which is where I got this word from. Um, so it's all about kind of sprucing up your ggplots, how to customize them to look the way you want them to look. Uh, and actually pretty timely, uh, Lisa Debreen, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Um, actually had a tweet about like, uh, where she did a poll about what people were struggling with when it came to ggplot and customizing plots was like the clear plot winner, uh, poll winner. Um, and she asked people for like, what is the stuff you're struggling with? So I actually took a couple of those uh, answers she got to that thread and try to kind of um, show how you can solve them here. She, that thread is also super, super nice. Uh, she gives very nice, like short tweets on how to solve each of these issues. So um, really well done. I don't know if I could do this in a tweet format. So the basis of my, uh, what we're going to do today is that I have this plot, which is, uh, I'm going to go through what the data set is very shortly, but it's basically going from this uh, to this. That's like where we want to end up today. Um, and don't think that just because I know Gigi thought this was like, this was not ballpark easy for me to do. This was uh, actually, uh, it was quite tricky, but I learned a lot and, um, I had a lot of fun <laughs> doing this. So uh, I wanted to figure out like a nice data set to work with. So uh, I went to the Tidy Tuesday uh, repository and I had a look at like what had been the data set they'd had recently. So if you want challenges to visualize data in different ways, the Tidy Tuesday a uh, project is awesome for doing that. It has lots of great data sets that you can explore in different ways and kind of learn different ways of visualizing the data. It's uh, super, super fun. Um, post your stuff on Twitter afterwards and get lots of like likes and, and retweets and it's all fun and dandy. So a couple of weeks ago, um, they had a data set on the Bechtel test for movies. So if you don't know what the Bechdel test is, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right either, so I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> um, 
it's basically a test uh, to check like um, how well represented females actually are in movies and how uh, diverse we're going to say diver diverse kind of uh, female casts are uh, or plots are in movies. So there are like three things you have to do to pass the Bechdel test. And there the bar is so low, you guys. It is so low. Um, so one, it has to have at least two named female characters. Two, they have to talk to each other. And three, they have to talk to each other about something that is not a man. And you would think, you would think that this bar is so low that most movies pass it. Uh, but no, no, they don't. Um, so we're going to explore that. There's a lot more fun to do with a with the data set that we're working on here. I kind of took like the simple way around it, but it it's both fascinating and extremely aggravating <laughs> to look at at the same time. And uh, so it's it's a pretty fun data set to work with. So uh, I got the Tidy Tuesday data set by um, installing the Tidy Tuesday R package from GitHub and then loading the, um, the data for ooh, very sensitive mouse. Which way am I going this way? OK, not using my mouse anymore. Um, so most of this is I'm not going to go through how I like data munch stuff. Um, I'm going to share my slides and the whole process with you uh, later. Uh, so you can look through that yourself. But I'm basically just grabbing the data as it's shown on the repository website. Um, and I'm merging the Bechtel test data with IMDb, IMDb uh, information that has like information on the genres of the movies and uh, money spent, money earned, all that stuff. Awards they've won. I actually wanted to do something on awards, but that was all string data. And I was like, okay, I can't be bothered fixing string data now. I want something simpler. Uh, and after I join the two data sets together, I make a binary zero one column for if they fail or pass the Bechdel test. And I bin the years in decades, just because that's gonna plot a little bit nicer basically than trying to plot every year, at least for the type of plot I'm making. If you're making a line plot, every year is nicer. I'm making a bar charts, so then the decades kind of make a nicer summary. Um, and then just to point out, I take away the documentaries because there's so few of them that they ended up not looking very nice. And there's some that are not categorized by genre either. So I took them away as well. And that kind of made my whole grid of genres much nicer when I took away those two, the grids ended up being like very nicely aligned. Uh, and we're gonna go through why I do this very weird, <laughs> Uh, flipping of the sign. So I'm actually going to switch to a script because I'm going to be daring. Because uh, I figured out after a while when I was working on this presentation that having ggplot code, when you customize a ggplot, um, you end up writing quite a lot of code to customize it. And it just doesn't fit very well on a slide. <laughs> uh, and it started becoming quite confusing. So I have the slides and I will share them with you uh, later. They're going to be on GitHub. Um, so they're going to be available for everyone. And it's it has a CC BY license, so you can do whatever you want with it, copy it, uh, whatever. Um, but I'm going to live code it here so that we can rather, so you can more follow along in my process. And we're going to do this a lot like I actually have this process. And it's a lot of backwards and forth which is why it works best just live coding. So we're gonna grab some data. So I have a cheat sheet, obviously, because I'm not gonna type all this stuff. As I showed on the slide, I'm grabbing the data and then I'm merging. Oh yeah, I forgot I had that. I have a couple of like base variables on the top that helps me set some, so, I bin the 
the years by decade. I tried by like every fifth year or second year. That's why I made it into a variable. So I could kind of vary and see what worked best. And decade definitely worked best. And since I'm going to make a pretty large plot at some point, I also um, set the base font size to something so I can use that later and kind of set like the fonts to be the same basic uh, structure or size, size, that's the word I was after. Um, yeah. So we read in the data and we bin them by year and we end up having a data set that's pretty large. So there's like 1,000, hey, almost Ma, one, yeah. Would you zoom in a little bit? Yeah. Thank you. That better? Uh, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks for speaking up. It's hard for me to know. <laughs> um, right, so we have this data set with almost 1,800 movies uh, and 38 variables, and that's like a bit too much. So I've already made the bin uh, for the decades. So we're gonna do a bit of data summaries. So we get a data set that has less rows. So I'm taking the Bechdel data that I made on here. And the genres are actually, so this is actually a lot of super tidy formats. So every movie obviously can be part of several genres. Um, so we separate the rows by, so we take the genre column and we create one row per genre a movie has. So that's going to make our data even longer than they are. So if I run those two, Suddenly we have 4,000, almost 300 observations. So, um, so that's quite a lot of data, but we're gonna summarize them all again. So I do some trimming of white space in the genre cause it's in there. We take away the documentary and everything that doesn't have a genre. I group it by genre, the year bin, which is the decade for the movie. And if they pass or fail the test, and I do a tally, which gives me <clears throat> how many movies for each genre in each year that pass or fail the Bechdel test. And then I do some mutating. So I get the number of movies that uh, pass or fail. So this, so the small n will be positive. Uh, for everything that passes and negating for everything that doesn't pass. And then the same goes for the percent. And that's because I want like a mirrored x-axis. Um, and I'll show you why very shortly. Um, and I don't need this group by. And, and I make a pseudo, um, what's it called? Uh, another column for the year bin for the decades, that's just a number from one to five, which I will sh tell you why later. We'll get to it a little bit later why that I had to do that hack to uh, make the plot as nice as I wanted. So I end up with this data set um, that has genre, decade, or year bin, as I call it, a binary that says uh, pass or fail, how many movies have passed or failed uh, in the small n? In the large n is the how many movies are in that genre and year. Um, the percentage that pass or fail and this dummy coded variable. And this is what we're going to start plotting with. And where is my plot? Where's my plot? <clears throat> Ooh, I got suddenly super nervous and am I making stupid things? Okay, here we go. So I'm going to start by making my bar chart. I'm just going to annotate here the plot so that when we start making really long code, I know how to navigate back to it. <clears throat> so this is the first bar uh, plot I started with. Um, and hopefully you can all see it. Can I move this zoom thing? There we go. So I can see it a bit better. Um, 
So, and I mean, this is fine, but it's a little bit hard to compare across the genres, right? Because some of the uh, genres have lots of movies in them. Some of them have few movie movies. And what I'm after is not how many movies is in there. It's like percentage wise, how many pass and fail for each genre across the years. So, um, and I don't like it when they're stacked like this because now it's kind of hard to see um, what is what, what's passing, what's failing. And they're a little bit like, yeah. <clears throat> and I took the absolute because actually, if you remember the N variable I have is either positive or negative. So for all the fails, it's actually negative. And for all the passes, it's positive. And that's because I really, really like it when um, positives and negatives are mirrored in this way. This probably comes because uh, I'm in a field that works with reaction times a lot. And this is a very classical way that we plot reaction times um, for answering correctly and incorrectly to some task. And then we kind of do this mirroring of the reaction time. So I've gotten really used to it and I actually really like how it looks. But it still is like the N and it makes things look a bit weird. So I also have a column that's percent. So when we plot that instead, now it starts to get a little bit easier because now we're not talking about, um, now we're not looking at how many movies there is in each genre. It's just percentage wise, how many are failing and how many are passing. And then we can like already see there are like <clears throat> some genres that are better than others. Like this music category, that's obviously pretty awesome. Almost everything passes. Uh, musicals are pretty good as well. While like action movies, that's, well, maybe quite unsurprising. War movies, unsurprising. Westerns, unsurprising. Few pass. Uh, so, well, <clears throat> that's how it looks. But I'm still not like happy with how, like I think we can do better in how things look here. Um, so I think it's kind of hard looking at it this way. Um, I, I think like right now you can barely see the years. I could flip the years so that they kind of go uh, vertically instead of horizontally. But in my opinion, when you flip, if I could spell, when you flip the coordinates of a plot like this, it becomes a little bit easier to read. Not everyone likes that. And that's fair enough. Like, People are different in how they like their data plotted. Um, I think this makes it a little bit cleaner. Uh, it's easier to read. Um, the spaces between things become nicer and it's just, uh, that's my preference. So there you go, you can flip then. And what cord flip is, it, it literally does that. It flips your X and your Y. So they're like the other way around. This does make the rest of the plot, this does make that do that, the rest of our customization, we need to kind of remember that we flip the axis because now it's super easy for us to think that percentage is on the X and uh, years are on the Y because that's what we're looking at. But for ggplot, it's actually still the other way around. So whatever we do to manipulate the Y, as we see it, we have to tell ggplot that that's actually the X. So that's a little bit of like, yeah, it takes a bit of a while to get used to. And I'm actually not sure if you get used to it. You kind of just do the wrong thing and then remember that you actually did the flip and then you do the right thing afterwards. Um, right. So uh, I'm not happy with the y-axis here, uh, which is actually the, I mean, the x-axis we're looking at, the y-axis <laughs> for ggplot um, that has this like, Minus, minus one, minus 0.5, zero. So these are percentages. And for some of them, it's flipped and not. And it's percentages from zero to one, right? Because that's how I made them. But in the plot, I want them to be actual percentages. So, and I'm lazy. So I don't want to go into my data and start manipulating my data. I just want ggplot to know <laughs> that these are percentages. So please display them as such. And we're pretty lucky that ggplot actually has something that can do that for us. So we can manipulate how the axes look by using the scale functions. So the scale functions do a lot of stuff. So they 
manipulate any aesthetic, the axes, the colors, the fill, anything that is an aesthetic that goes into the AES uh, in ggplot can usually be manipulated through uh, some scale function. And in this case, I'm telling, I'm saying for scale y continuous because you remember we flipped it, so it's the opposite of what we see. I want to use this function from the scale package, which is called percent. And what it does, it literally takes values that go from zero to one understand that these are percentages. So it um, <clears throat> multiplies by 100 to get the true percentage and then adds a percentage sign to it. Uh, obviously that's gonna make uh, our axis a little bit messy right now because the text is a bit too large and everything's squished together and it doesn't look nice. Um, but we're gonna fix that in the theme. But another thing I don't like is I, like, the fail side still has like a negative sign in front of it. And I mean, negative percentages don't make any sense, right? Like they're, uh, it just doesn't make sense. And we only flip them to get this visual effect. We don't want to put any meaning to this like uh, flipping. So we can just make our own little custom function that I'm going to call absolute percent, which takes an X which is a vector. And we're going to apply the scales percent function on it, but we're going to wrap the x in an absolute first so that it takes the absolute value of x and then feeds it to the scale percent um, function to get uh, displayed nicely. So we're going to give labels our apps percent function instead. And when we run everything then, suddenly, the sign is gone and it's from 150 to zero and then from 0, 050 to 100 again on both sides of the scale. Looking better. Um, so um, again, let's start fixing the theme a bit. So I mean, the default theme of ggplot, uh, people love, people hate, do whatever you want. It's nice for, it looks fair, fair enough for like a quick look, but usually you want to do something with it. And I'm not going to use any of the like pre-built ones. We're just going to make our own because uh, that's what you need to do if you really want to go the way of customizing it. So one of the first things I usually do is uh, move my legend. because. Um, I don't like it on the side. I usually like it better on the bottom because in this case, because I have so many subplots going sideways, I want it to kind of fill the space as much as possible. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Um, which is better for me. I also know that I want a little bit more space between each of the panels because in the end, this is gonna be a plot like, let's say, I'm gonna to give to people who are not used to reading plots. Uh, and then having a bit more space between things actually make it a bit easier to read. So we're gonna add some space. Um, and we do that through, again, the theme. So one of the things I really love about our studio is you start typing something in a function and it's like, oh, here are some suggestions for you. And this is usually how I like, find the stuff that I'm after because I don't remember them by heart. Uh, I don't even think Handley or Thomas remembers them by heart to kind of make and maintain this package. Uh, there's a lot of options, so it takes some time. Uh, so I want to change the panel spacing. And panel spacing takes something called units, which is uh, a ggplot thing. Um, units, not units. Un I can't spell units. Um, and I want the space, so I'm going to end up having a pretty fairly well-sized plot. So I'm going to space them by 0.3 centimeters. This isn't going to look nice in the viewer of our studio, but I know it's going to look nice when we print it in a larger image like I did for, um, for my first slide. 
not enough. Do I want a bit more? I think I might want a bit more. Let's take 0.6. And this is usually how, yeah, there we go. That's better. Uh, this is usually how I go about it. I'm like, I try a value and then I'm like, mm, maybe I've made four. And then I do that uh, instead. <clears throat> okay, so things are starting to kind of fill out the way I want them to. Um, but there's a still, so my other plot, it had like this black background and it was super dramatic. Like anything with a black background looks pretty dramatic. So let's start making that. Um, and that's again done in the theme. So I know that plot background, that's like where you set the background color for everything. And the theme takes these like weird elements. And the first time <laughs> someone, showed me these elements I was like I'm never gonna get this this doesn't like I don't understand how it works but now that I've used them for a while I'm like oh, this makes all the sense in the world just think of it as anything else with R and ggplot just do it enough times and it starts making sense to you so the background of a plot is just a rectangle and in this case we just want the rectangle to be another color than white so we give it an element rect and we tell it that the fill because uh, rectangles either get filled with a color or if you specify the color, that's like the edge around the color. So if you're used to making bar charts, it's the same principle. So if you put a color in a bar chart that just changes the color around the edge of the bar rather than filling the bar itself. So we're gonna fill it with black. Oh yeah, there we go. Black background for the whole plot. So that's the whole plot. Um, but then uh, one of the nice things about making a faceted plot like I've done here uh, is that it, now it's also quite obvious that there's a difference between the plot, which is like the entire space the, uh, the plot occupies and like the panel where like the data of the plot is. And in ggplot that's called a panel. Um, and the first times I were I was adapting themes, I was doing that on the single plot, and I could never understand the concept of like plot background and panel background. I was like, why aren't these the same? Like, why can't you just fix both with one? But this is the reason. Like, there's a there is an actual difference between the plot background and the panel background. So we also need to change the panel background now. In this case, I want the panel background and the plot background to be the same. So rather than saying that panel background is an element rect with fill black, I'm just gonna say that it's element blank, blank, which just means it's not gonna be there anymore. Like there's not gonna be a panel background at all. So if I change the plot background color to anything else, that's automatically gonna be inherited. Like it's also gonna change the panel background because the panel background isn't there basically. <clears throat> yeah. And now, oh, those grids look horrible, horrible. Don't need them. Uh, grids can be great, especially for um, scatter plots in bar charts. I'm not sure the grids help all that much anyway. So we're gonna take away the grid. And just like we did with panel background, I'm just gonna say panel grid is element blank. Go away, don't want ya, bye-bye. Okay, so that's a little bit neater, a little bit cleaner now. Um, the bars are clearly standing out. Um, it's not too like busy. Um, so you can start like really appreciating what the data is saying, but now the legend looks like sc it's screaming at me, please change, please change it. Um, so we're going to change the element background again, it's going to be element blank. Let's have a look at that. Um, going to need to do something about the text being black on a black background, that's obviously not a very good idea. So let's let, I can't spell, let 
legend is element. So again, it's nice with the suggestion. Something that's text should probably be an element text. Just kind of makes sense once you get used to the elements. And we want the color. So I don't want the color to be white because that's a bit like a bit too strong. So I'm going to go with a color that's um, gray 90, which is almost white, but just like a little bit grayed out. So it's not going to scream too much. Um, yeah, cool. So now the colors for the theme are clearly um, colored. So I'm pretty happy with where I am with the theme right now. So one of the things I really, I don't like the panels. And um, yeah, so I'm not finished with the theme. Let's change the panels. So the strip, the background of uh, the strip for like the header of each panel, it's a bit garish. So we're gonna change it. So we're gonna make that black as well. Uh, or actually we're gonna make it Guess what? Blank. <laughs> so that in here, so that it has the same color as everything else, and it's called strip. Well, it took me a long time to find uh, that it was called strip. It really like because it's like at the bottom of the list. So I was like leafing through all of the options of themes. Like what? What can it possibly be? And by the time I got to strip, I was like. Ah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Sure, sure, it's called strip. Um, but it was completely. There was no way I would have thought of that on my own. And obviously, if I make the strip um, background black and the text inside there is black, we're not going to see that. So uh, we're going to change the text. No, not legend. We already said it was strip, right? <laughs> strip text is element text. Um, color gray 90. Okay, so we're actually starting to get pretty close. Uh, and most of the work is done in the theme. We're going to do a lot of extra fancy stuff if I get the time. If not, you're going to get the slides so you can look at <laughs> the code later. Um, but I had this idea. So when I was looking at this, I was like, oh, okay, so this is fun, but wouldn't like really, wouldn't it be cool um, if like the text for each of the genres kind of mimic the genres, like the movie titles in these movies usually have. Like, so for the horror movie, it would be like, uh, for the horror genre that the text, the font would be like blood dripping stuff. Uh, and for romance, it would be like this nice, like curly uh, um, kind of font. And I thought, yeah, let's do that. And this is where I really start learning <laughs> a lot because I haven't actually dared changing fonts too much in ggplot because I have heard it can be a bit painful. And most of it is actually getting R, R itself to work with fonts, not ggplot, but like R as like a, a system. So we're not going to have any text in the strip because there is no way in the theme to specify like dynamic fonts. The theme specifies one thing for everyone. So like everything here happens, everything you do in the theme will happen like globally for the plot. So if I want to change the font, it means I need to add another geom with text. And in this geom, I need to somehow add like this dynamic font system. So that's going to be fun. So I took away that. And now this is like co completely uninformative plot. You have no idea what's going on. <laughs> uh, let's get some stuff in here. But before we can do that, we actually need to make sure that we have some data that we can put in there. And I have a cheat sheet of a code and you're going to be blown away when I paste it because it's a lot. I did not say that I wasn't going to go through all of the data munching 
And so I'm sorry about that because it does require quite a lot of data munching. <clears throat> so what am I doing? What am I doing? Mu, you're doing a lot of stuff. Please explain it to us. I will go through it. So I'm taking the Bechtel data um, by decade. That's what the BD stands for. And I group it by genre and year and I summarize it so um, that at the end, I get a data set that has one row per genre. Okay, I'm gonna use this for other things as well. As well. So it's one row per genre. Uh, it has a number of movies that have passed the Bechtel test and the number of movies as a whole in that category. Uh, and then I calculate the mean of movies that pass. I make it into the this scaled percentage already there because uh, that's going to make it easier for me later. Um, oh, I overwrite it. That's interesting. I, oh, I don't even use this. Oh, I overwrite it. This is what happens when I do too many things at once. Bye bye. Um, I make a variable that says if a movie's mean is above 0.5. 55, it means that more movies pass than fail. If it's below 0.45, more movies fail than pass. And if it's somewhere in between, it's about equal amounts. Um, and I make that into a factor so that I can control the way it's plotted in ggplot. Because by default, if you give ggplot a character vector, it will do it alphabetically, because that's how our handles factors by default, right? It gives it um, uh, levels by um, um, their alphabetic names, but I wanted them ordered in a very specific way because I want to control how it plots later. So I do that and I rescale the mean. We're not gonna go through what that means, but it's because I want a nice line on the plot about where the mean for uh, this is. And it actually, because our scale goes from technically from minus one to one, I needed to rescale the percentages um, uh, that go from zero to 100 to actually be rescaled from minus one to one. It's a whole thing. I've literally just uh, got some code from Stack Overflow and it worked. Uh, <laughs> and this is where the fun stuff happens. So now that I have this data set that has one row per genre, um, I could start classifying um, or adding to the data set what font I wanted it to use. So these are all fonts I found on font101.org, which is like a free font service. You can download fonts. And <clears throat> I added the names to the fonts here, um, which amazingly actually worked as long. Oh, I didn't actually add. As long as we do the little bit of magic, again, the little bit of magic that I found on Stack Overflow, because <laughs> that's where uh, I learned all of this magic. And I'm going to put it at the top of my script because it has to do with loading fonts. So there's a package called Extra Font, uh, which is great from lo for loading system fonts into R. And then I don't need this. Uh, and then the first time you use extra font, you need to run this um, command called font import. And it will import all the fonts you have installed on your system so you can use them in R. And you have to tell it that you're going to use PostScript. I don't know exactly what that means, but it works. So I'm just happy. <laughs> if it works, don't uh, think about it. Um, and so I take the names of each of these fonts and I kind of classify them. So romance, biography, and history, they're kind of old timey kind of things. That's what history type things. So they get like this nice curly font. For once in my life, I get to use uh, Comic Sans for something. Uh, <laughs> and it's for comedy. Um, um, and so on. So I end up having a column called FF, font family. That's what it stands for. Um, with different fonts for the different genres. And any genre I couldn't really find a good font for, I just say, you get Helvetica on you. Like, 
it's a nice font, it works. And then because fonts actually are of different sizes, like some fonts are just larger than others, you've probably noticed if you've played it around with fonts in, in, in Word or other text editors, I had to kind of start scaling them up or down a little bit so that they would look more or less equal. And this is where like this base font size variable that I set at the top started becoming really um, convenient. And it was the reason I made it. It was when I started doing this and I didn't want to keep retyping the same thing. And I wanted to scale everything together if I changed one of them. So I need to actually run my rescale function <laughs> so that it's available. So you can see, there it is, uh, some stuff and it works. <clears throat> And there we go, thanks. Uh, and then at the end of all of that munching, I have a, now a data set of 20 rows because I have 20 genres, how many paths, how many movies are in there, the mean of them, the nice kind of factor long string of it, a cryptic value that's uh, been scaled between one, zero, one, nine, minus one and one, and the font name, and the font size. That's what FF font family FS font size. And that's what we're going to use. Uh, where did you go? Little piece of magic. Here we go. And I'm going to add it before the facet. So I usually, when I do this custom stuff, I kind of distinguish between when I add geoms and when I add other stuff so that I kind of uh, have a control of it, but ggplot doesn't actually care. I mean, the geoms have to come in the right order for them to be plotted on top of each other in a specific way, but everything else can just come in between. But if you start making something that's getting as big as this, it's good to um, kind of try to have a system for how you do it. So when we do that, uh, yeah. It worked, but stuff is clipped. Uh, and that is kind of expected um, because ggplot, when something is outside of where it thinks the scale of something is, it just goes, yeah, I don't care. Like it's not in the plot, go away. We want to turn that off. We want it to show everything that's also outside. So it's very easy, thankfully, if you know where to do it. And that's in the chords. So any chord you might have applied, in this case, I'm applying chord flip. If you're not applying anything, you add chord Cartesian, which is the default coordinate system, and you say clip equals off. And that means it's not going to clip away the tops or the things that are uh, above or below the plot. Uh, this also was a thing that took me a while to figure out. And once I did, I was like, oh, this solves so many problems. Thank you for actually thinking uh, that some of us wanted this. <laughs> um, and now we have like kind of fun. I mean, it's kind of fun, right? When you have these uh, these fonts in there and they can change. And I don't know if, uh, if I would ever use this in my work, but like for Tidy Tuesday and a plot like this, I think it kind of makes fun and it, it makes it, um, it, it's worth it and it kind of, gives uh, the plot a little bit more pop. So I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna do um, I'm gonna add some labels to the plot because a plot without annotations is just sad um, and completely difficult for anyone to read. <laughs> um, the labs function can who, and then this happens. Yeah, which is, should be expected. Um, of course you can't see anything because all of my labels are uh, um, in black, like the text is in black and my background is in black. So obviously that's not gonna show up. So let's make sure that everything is in white and happy by adding this. So I'm adding 
specification that text in general should be Helvetica new and have the base font size I've set and the gray 80 in color. I specify that the plot title should be four times the size of my base font. The subtitle should be three times my base font size. Be adjusted a little bit. I could take that away for now so you see why I did that. And should be in italic. It should be italicized. And then the cop plot caption should be just slightly larger than the base font size. Uh, and then they appear. Everything's kind of squished. But um, we're going to make it better by moving the legend even more very shortly. So I took away this V just of the subtitle. And the reason it's there is because I don't want the subtitle like pasted to the data. I want it like closer to the title. Um, so V just vertically adjusts uh, some text and you think, um, and that kind of pops it up where I want it to be. So that looks a bit tidier. Um, again, the number 15, don't think that I found that like, because that's natural for me to know that it should be 15. Uh, I was like three, okay, 10, okay, 12, okay, no, 15, okay. And 15 looked good. So a lot of it is, is just trial and error. And I don't like the position of the legend. It's just, it's just no good. Bottom here is no good. It's, uh, it's just, what is it doing there? It's just making a lot of mess. And this, I didn't actually know um, because I haven't actually used it because I've always used like these text formats, bottom, top, uh, whatever that's kind of built in. But you can actually give it coordinates to where the legend should go. Um, again, trial and error. I have like these numbers mean nothing to me, uh, but they got them there. <laughs> so uh, trial and error and they ended up uh, in this spot. Um, which still is not awesome, but it's getting close. So I have 10 more minutes. So the question is, do you want me to keep going or do you want to ask me questions? <laughs> what do people think? I'm good with either. Um, so we have some votes for keep going, but how about I ask you one question that's in the chat so that you can start like incorporate that in. There was one question that was asking, what does size equals the identity of FS Ooh. mean? Yeah, I totally skipped talking about that. Okay. Uh, so the I in FS, so I here, when you put in, um, so I is a function that comes from ggplot and it stands for identity, like Mina says. Um, so maybe if you're used to bar charts, um, you've been around this stat equal identity before, right? So in this case, I've already made my summary statistics. So I don't want geom bar to try to make a summary statistic for me. So I said, use the identity of the data I give you, the value as is from the data I give you. The I function does the same. And this is a bit of a hack. Uh, and I don't actually see these in any um, official guides for how to do things, but I find them to be extremely convenient in cases like this. So I works for size or color or whatever. Um, if you have a color uh, as a column in your data set, like, and you want to use those, uh, you've probably noticed that if you use color equals that column in ggplot, it'll give them completely different colors, right? It's not the colors in your data. Um, it just gives them some, some factor default colors. But if you wrap the column name in I, it actually will, because it says use the identity, use the values that are given to you directly. And this is, what ha is what ha what's happening with the font size in this case. Because size is a, in ggplot is actually a really tricky concept to work with uh, because it doesn't actually use the size as given. It creates a factor of the size and then uses that. Uh, it's just, and for font size, that just makes it very, very hard to work with. So 
I've already made the font size in a column. So I just use say, use the identity, like use the numbers as given here for the point size of the font. That's what it means. Uh, I love this I function. Like when I discovered, like I use it all the time, even though I don't see it officially used anywhere. It's really, really nice. Is it me. like scale size identity? Is that the same? Like, is that basically doing that? Yeah, it's basically doing that. I just find this to be cleaner. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just right in there. Um, but it's a bit obscure if, if you've ever been around it before. And I don't even know if it's going to be there forever. Uh, I just know that I love it. And if Thomas ever takes it away, I'll be screaming on GitHub. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, someone said to make the legend horizontal, which I can. Um, and I technically have that somewhere. I actually, um, so one of the things I do the, in the end plot is like here, it's kind of hard to see which move, like which genres as a whole pass or fail. And I wanted it to be like easy to see if a genre passes or fails the Bechdel test. And a way I thought of doing that was to actually add, add to change the color of the background of the panel for each plot uh, to indicate if the genre as a whole passes or fails. So much like we could do, um, we could do with like substituting the strip text with a geom. I'm going to use that for the panel background because I can change the panel background in the theme because that's going to make it the same for everyone. Um, so I'm going to use the, the Bechtel mean data set that we've already made, which has one row per genre. Um, and I'm going to make a rectangle in the background and I'm using something called the infs. So what the inf, infs does, it's like the infinite. It finds the the tops and the bottoms of each panel in ggplot, basically. It's really nice, like shorthand for just find the maximum like boundaries of the plot panel and fill it with um, the factor PC pass, which says if it's pass, if more fail than pass, if more pass than fail, or if about equal amounts, uh, do both. So if I run that, this is gonna look absolutely uh, bananas because the colors are horrible together by default. But now we've colored the background, but the background actually goes halfway up into um, the font or the title of each genre, because now genre is a geom. So it thinks that's like the top of the plot and we don't want that. But thankfully again, in clip, we can set the limits and because we flipped it, it means we have to set the X limits. <laughs> Again, you have to, I did this wrong, obviously, the, fourth, the first time I did it. Um, and by trial and error, I found that 0.7 and 5.3 were the limits I liked. Uh, and then it's squished together. And the last thing we're gonna, last thing I have time for, <laughs> is fix the color. Because the color is god awful. Who wants that? Um, and this could have been nicer. So I make, so I say that the fill, because I use fill for the rectangle in the background, I also use fill for the bars. That's what this like weird legend here is. We should probably just fix that before we finish as well. So I don't leave you all with this horrible thing in the way. I make a vector. Yeah, I forgot to make the palette vector, um, which is here. So we're going to put that at the top here. I have a palette of two colors. I mean, since I'm doing it this way now, I could have made the whole palette, but I'm not because of I messy in the way I work sometimes, which is um, a nice muted pink and a nice muted green uh, that I very much love that I just found. Um, and I make a vector of one, two, three, four, five, because that's, I mean, you can only see four of them because the last one is like below the plot right now. There are five colors 
uh, in this Phil legend. <clears throat> and because uh, it's categorical, I need to make sure that the colors are given in to the values as I want. So I want my palette, which is this nice pink and green, to go for um, the levels, uh, let's say if more fail and pass, pass than fail and about equal. And I want the fail and pass, which are the uh, bars in here of different colors to be just muted gray and white. And when we run that, it looks way better. <laughs> Not so, yeah. Uh, and as it's pointed out, yes, you can also make a named vector. Since I was just making this one plot, I find it just as nice to do it this way. But if I'm working on a paper and I'm using like the same groups over and over again in my plots, I would definitely make a named vector and use that because then I'm sure that my groups are given the same color in every chart. Uh, it's great. The first time I found that, I was like, why don't people talk more about this? It's genius. Um, so the last thing we're going to do is make sure that our legend doesn't look so crazy. And we use that by guide. So the guides are a thing that just never stick with me. I have to Google this every time, every time. I never remember how to do this. Uh, I always do it the wrong way around, but thankfully Google uh, is there <laughs> uh, and there's lots of stuff to do. I mean, it could still be better because it's a bit big, um, but we can fix the size. I mean, I'm one minute over. Let me just fix the size. I can do this here. Uh, in here, and usually my theme is a little bit better than this. Like I'd usually make sure the theme is like by category. So all the panels are together, all the legend stuff is together. Um, so now I just, again, use the unit to make sure that um, the keys are a little bit smaller so they don't take up so much space. And we're more or less uh, there. So if I zoom in, do you guys see that or not? I don't even know. Yep, can see. Yeah, uh, actually it looks a bit crazy, um, but it looks better in the presentation. So this is like one of the downsides with Gplot is like I, and it was one of the questions I know uh, Lisa De Bruyne had um, in that thread is like, how do you know how things look when you save it? contrary to how they look in like the R Studio of Europe pane. And that is like, it's a, the struggle is real. It actually is quite hard. <laughs> uh, I never get it right. Like I get it looking really nice in the R Studio of Europe pane. And then I save the PNG or the SVG. And then I look at it, it was like, yeah, no, that's not, this is not what I expected. And then I have to start tweaking again. So it definitely is uh, a little bit tricky getting it to, to where you want when you start saving it. Uh, but in the Sharigan presentation, um, because it's HTML and because uh, when you save a ggplot, when you make a ggplot in an R markdown HTML document, it's saved as an SVG, meaning it looks exactly what you've seen it look like, uh, which is <laughs> uh, quite convenient. So yeah. That's a lot of stuff to go through in one hour, guys. <laughs> so I don't really expect everyone to remember all of this stuff. I mostly wanted to kind of highlight stuff you can do, and you can do so, so much. Um, but it really is trial and error. No one makes a Gigi float like this with like just writing through it and everything goes the way they want. It's a lot of trial and error. And in the end, you get that like, yes, this is what I wanted. Uh, yeah. And it feels awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's give Mo a round of Zoom applause, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, let me um, stop the recording.